small group of people that we work with a lot was for um, specifically for DevOps training. So um, yeah, if, you're, if you don't get enough information about that tonight, please let me know because I am seeing quite a lot of senior people in here tonight, which is pretty cool and very interested in, uh, in learning about cloud. So that's really great. Okay, I think we're on time. Anybody else who's late can just join us a little bit later. And we've got a really good turnout tonight. So yeah, so we are Be Cloud Ready. Uh, we're a 2015 founded uh, startup. We're in Toronto. We do AI and cloud products. Um, my name is Nicholas Guthrie. I am a data scientist at Be Cloud Ready, but I am very much transitioning over towards uh, more being a software developer. The kind of the trend seems to be that if you have a PhD in machine learning, um, that is quite something. But otherwise, more mostly being on the developer side with enough machine learning um, knowledge to use, kind of like out of the box models, is kind of the way I I believe the industry is going, anyways. So kind of in a transition role for myself as well. And uh, yeah, enough enough about us. Um. Oh yeah. So of course we've done some uh, some DevOps. Uh, corporate training. We also do, so beyond products, we also do corporate training and we do work with individual students as well. Um, either trying to go from, you know, where they are to like a higher level, uh, a more senior position, or kind of just having a lot of tips about how to break into the industry for people who want to make the transition from other fields. Um, so yeah, we've had, we've had the opportunity to work with some really big names in the States. We're very proud to work with them and kind of train them in DevOps and uh, some of our training here. And so tonight we have with us uh, Channing Kumar. He's one of the founders of Be Cloud Ready, uh, 15 years of experience, chief data architect and uh, senior DevOps consultant. And he's, you know, he's worked with some of the biggest banks up here in Canada and, um, you know, some other very, you know, some household names doing, uh, you know, monitoring very, very large projects. And he started off as a software uh, uh, developer, software engineer, and uh, kind of worked his way all the way up. So uh, yeah, without further ado, I'm actually going to hand it over to, train, uh, to Channon, who has like a lot of advice about how to uh, break into the field and some advice for senior people as well. Hey, thanks, Nicholas. So I'll take the screen. Hello, everyone. And please let me know if I'm not audible. Otherwise, I hope I, you guys can hear me. We can hear you. So today's hear you. webinar, yeah, okay. So today's webinar will be will be covering a lot of things, <clears throat> and uh, uh, I will explore the tech and data landscape and how the industry is moving. And when I say tech, I we should always assume tech and data is no longer a separate field. Times are gone where you used to have a different data science team, mostly statisticians sitting on some desk and you have software developer completely working on somewhere else. In many cases, the departments were completely different. The engineering was handled by engineering team and it was completely by your analytics team. And what we see trend over past five years, what has happened is that these two teams have merged. And that is why people are looking more and more for a hybrid skill rather than one. Of course, specialization always has value, but the, the approach of a solving a data problem has mostly become a technology driven. So that is why you can see there is a lot of confusion in the market like, okay, which way should I go? Should I become a data engineer, data scientist or a cloud engineer? So we will talk a little bit on that, but we will be talking more in general if you are looking to break into a field and I will be taking example of mostly technology and assuming data is as well technology and what basic, uh, basic schema or I would say basic um, path that you can choose to land be successful. And these all experience, I'm not telling from a reading a book or anything, I'm telling from my own life experience like I myself immigrant, I lived and worked in three continent, at least three, four countries I have worked. And everywhere pretty much I went, I had to start my career from zero. And that is what over the past many years, what mistakes I did. And that is what pretty much I have uh, made into a, this kind of a slide, which can help anybody to do uh, follow the path and don't repeat the same mistake, which I did. So without further ado, I'll start. So first we'll explore the technology landscape. What is going on in the market right now? <laughs> so if you are talking about tech landscape, pretty much you can see uh, there was a survey done by a Canadian organization. They, they interviewed almost 500 CIOs and what they find out and they, the question was simple. What do you think in next five years, things are gonna change? Things are gonna be most disruptive so what they find out is these are the four categories 
80% say data privacy and data security. 70-70% said AI and machine learning. 73 said cloud uh, technology and 72, they're talking about Internet of Things. More or less, even if you combine all of these, all of these are actually somehow related to cloud or some kind of data services. So even though it looks like a four category, but actually there are two categories. So what trending up and what trending down? So InfoSec and cloud and data analytics is just red hot. Everybody knows about it. And then you're talking about data center management, web development, network admin, these are all in decline because it means they're not anymore hiring new resources for that. And next five years, they are looking to hire mostly on this side, the left side of it. So if you are on the left side of it, it's better to be on that side because this is the growing field of it. So when we talk about technology nowadays, it is a lot of confusion out there. Pretty much everybody, you must have heard of these terms, right? Kubernetes, microservices, big data, AI, TensorFlow, and all this thing. And the problem is that it creates a lot of cloud of confusion in the brain of someone who doesn't know, or maybe they just want to break into the field. And it actually, a lot of time sends you in the wrong direction where you should be going. So what happens is basically most cases you get an information overload. So it's your mind, you have only one mind. So one side people are coming AI, big data, Azure, Java, pretty much it says I just put all the hot technology right now, buzzword I'm talking about. And those birds, buzzwords come to your brain. And if you, um, if you haven't been in the industry or if you haven't matured your career with this industry, it is very hard to capture. Even when I, when I did my transition, it was perplexing for me for at least a year. I just couldn't understand what, what they meant by this. And what typically people do is that your like solution is always, we try to do multiple things, right? It's a very, very common thing. I did the same thing. Go to YouTube, YouTube learning, bootcamp, online classes, internship, college, expert advice, you name it, you do everything. And unfortunately, what I've seen, nine out of 10 cases, this approach doesn't work. If this approach worked, everybody would have been like a uh, successful, but that is not the case. It has a very high failure rate. Reason is simple. It just creates a lot of distraction. For example, you're trying too many things. You're chasing buzzword because buzzword, they keep changing. What is hot right now? In one month from now, that is gone. So if you're changing that buzzword every three months, you're changing your direction, it could actually backfire. And plus, so-called expert advices, the expert who are actually, who have never walked the same walk that you're going through, they cannot help. Like, I remember one person, he was explaining about how to become, how to transition your career. And you see that person is a, is a PhD in data science. And he is talking about how, how you can become a data science from doing nothing. It doesn't make sense. Another person I was saying, he was a computer science graduate, masters, and he's talking about this thing. It means they, they were always given on a silver plate, on a spoon fed, like they, were, they had their pedigree, they had their education. So they never experienced the pain of moving from one career to another career. So I have gone through the same. I did my electronics. I, when I did my engineering, in four years, maybe I have touched computer maybe four times just to, just to check my result. And finally, I somehow I learned how to write a Word document resume. I was able to send some resume. That's all I did. That's all my computer learning was there. And from there, I basically eventually transitioned to a developer. So there is a, so it, the story is always different from someone who is already maybe went to a great college, got right away job and everything, and someone who actually struggled. So if you can correlate any of these things, I think this is the perfect webinar for you. Like frustrated of trying everything, have no experience on network. I guess uh, you guys, I mean, you understand what I'm talking about. You can't get a job without networking unless you are someone exceptional. You feel people with similar jobs, similar skills are getting job, but you are not. You pretty much followed every expert advice, no result. And you did some internship as well and with the no result. And the last but not the least, the most important, you keep forgetting what you learned last month. This a lot of happens, right? You learn, for example, you learned, uh, I don't know, maybe one library this month, next month, 
and you just completely forget about that library. And what happens is that is a perpetual thing. Six months, you learn six things. And on the seventh one, if someone asks you anything about what you did on the third month, you say, I need to brush up. I forgot. So we'll go to the bottom of it, why that happens. And that is how to fix it. So at least you will be better prepared. So we'll talk first thing about, we'll talk about what tech industry wants in general from a resource, right? If they are hiring. So what they want is the industry wants someone has experience. Someone can solve a business or technology problem. Someone is a solution developer and they are ready for a production system. And what happens is that on the other side, most candidate, what they come up with, they have uh, maybe no buzzword, you know, bunch of buzzword, you know how to write sample code. So like a sample code, you download it from somewhere, you press the button, boom, it works. And you did some mock project, which has no commercial value. Absolutely. And possibly it can never happen. So it can only happen in academia. The problem with that approach is that that doesn't, that is what differentiate between a fresher and experienced person, right? Why they look for experienced person because experienced person has everything what you have. Left. They have experience, they know how to work with the business and they know they are a solution developer. They are looking for a solution to solve the problem. And rather than just, oh, I can write a Python code. I know how to write Python code. I know this, I know that. That is very good by the way, it's, it's by all means. But I think until unless you apply your skill to doing something, then they, it doesn't become very useful. For example, you went to a class, assume you were learning how to fix a car and you read everything in the book. Okay, how to fix a car, internal, internal combustion engine and everything. Until unless you actually fix a broken car, multiple times, you will never be able to fix a real car, right? So that is how you're learning. So this is what is all about that a, getting a hands-on experience working on something is a paramount. So this is a quick uh, view, like what industry wants and what you want and giving you another perspective, like you are going driving in a highway and suddenly your car broke down. And now two people came to you. One person says, hey, uh, I have read the book about how to fix car, but I have never fixed it. And another person says, Hey, I have a 10 years of experience fixing exactly your model of car. Whom will you pick up? Whom will you hire to fix your car right now? You'll see hey, why this guy is giving me this option. This is a no brainer. I'll ask the second guy. Same thing applies to employer. Why do you think employer will choose the first person who says, I only have bookish knowledge. I cannot do anything. So just put yourself in the shoe of employer, then things become very clear. And I've been through the same thing. I have, I have like worked many places and also I hire people. And when I went to the other side of the hiring table, then I realized, oh, these mistakes I was doing. And that is the biggest thing. So before to get into a, like any technology market or anything, first let's talk about the skill gap, what you're talking about. So how I see as a skill gap, you can divide into multiple, uh, multiple subsets. So one is a technical skill, one is a resume skill, one is an online portfolio, interview skill, and the most important is a powerful story. So let's deep, uh, dig deeper into the technical skill, right? So what are technical skills? So technical skill, when it comes, we usually see the job description. And usually in the job description, what we see is pretty much we see a lot of buzzwords. And a lot of buzzword, even for a fresher job, they pretty much they are asking so many, so many things that it is humanly impossible for someone to know so many things in a only matter of one year. I mean, it is very hard to know everything. And that is what you can see pretty much all filled, all job descriptions are filled with buzzwords. So many buzzword that it often sends you in a wrong direction. So let me tell you one big revelation. The job description is not a requirement. It is a wish list that employer wish that, oh, if I could get that person. But in reality, it never happens. For example, you want to buy a car. You want to buy, say, the best, like a luxury car. Maybe you want to buy a Tesla Model X. And what happens is that, okay, I only have budget for like $30,000. What are you going to do? You cannot afford that 30, the budget is very high. So when you go to the market, you have a wish list of a car 
And but assume maybe 30 is too much, maybe I'll say $15,000 you have budget. Then when you go to the market and you realize the money I have, I cannot afford that thing. So I have to compromise. So now you go back to your basics. What is my base requirement for a car? From going office to work and home to, uh, say from home to work or from the home to the grocery store. What I need, okay, a simple used Mazda car is good enough. So I will just go ahead and buy that car for now. Maybe later on I'll think. Similar way, whenever going to the job, you have to look for the core minimum requirement that exactly needed to solve the job. It means you need an engine which starts and there are four wheels and some kind of a protection so that you can go. Similarly in technology world, when I'm talking to open source technology world, when you're looking for a developer, these kind of jobs, pretty much the base, you can trim down to this level. You need a programming language. The Python is the very easy to learn programming language because if you're coming from a completely non-technical background, forget about learning Java and anything because you'll be wasting time because to become a decent Java developer takes a couple of years, at least three years to say the least. And someone thinks they can become Java developer in two months. I think it is a challenging. You have to put really, really good effort in order to do that. However, this Python, it has shown again and again is a relatively easy language. And that is why it is very popular among data professionals as well, as well as software developers. And then you have to have Linux. Linux is pretty much right now, even if you're learning a machine learning model or anything, you have to get used to Linux because pretty much everything is running on Linux. IT fundamentals. So if you don't have fundament foundation of like a software development, IT fundamental networking, these databases, then it's very difficult for you to comprehend the business problem. And of course, at least one cloud to be on your side because pretty much sooner rather than later, in the next five years, you will see everybody will move to cloud and, and one cloud is, has become a mandatory skill nowadays. And last but not the least, the most important is that you have to be able to demonstrate that you can perform and you have delivered at least or you have worked on an enterprise grade project which has a real customer. So the moment you have all these things, if you can showcase, that is the most powerful thing you can talk about. So this is about tech. So let's talk about say data. If you're talking about becoming a data engineer or data analytics or anything, at least you have to have understanding of what is the life cycle of the data. So you're talking about, you must understand acquiring data preparation, data analysis, data wrangling. So if these concepts you know, and if you have used these tools to actually implement these things, that is what makes you data engineer, right? So, so let, let me break down some of the IT skills that I talked about. So IT fundamental, when I'm saying, I'm talking about networking, operating system, database concepts. It's pretty much everybody needs it. Of course, if you are completely heavily going into analytics, possibly networking and OS concept, you don't need, but DB concepts you need for sure. Linux, you have to be comfortable with Linux. Doesn't matter where you are going. Python. And now basically Python is a very vast programming language. It's not like that you just learned two, three, four loops and you're good. It's very powerful and it can get complex when you're really trying to solve some complex problem. So heavily investing on Python and doing pretty much everything. And that is what the basically uh, how the Python software development changes, right? If you are, the base remains same and pretty much after, uh, once you have learned the foundation of Python, then basically you can branch out either towards the cloud or either towards the data. But from the day one, if you start doing data, what happens is that you will be able to solve some problem, but you'll be wasting so much time because you don't even understand the difference between list and a dictionary. And at that fundamental data structure concept is not understood. And also you don't know how to apply it. It can become very challenging. You may be able to do something, but you'll be wasting, your product will be very down, too much no, low productivity you will have. Then cloud, pick one cloud and focus on it and just heavily get into cloud architecture just to understand what it is. Because once you understand one cloud, pretty much any other cloud will be very easy for you. It goes back to like, for example, if you know how to drive a Mazda car, you can drive a Tesla as well, right? It's just a pretty much similar principle. So job, we can say we can broadly define, we will be talking about when I'm talking about tech job, I'm talking about these like developer, architect, data engineer, QA engineer, sysadmin, DBA, tech support, cloud engineer, and DevOps engineer. So these are pretty much 
gamut of job that can be targeted. And there is a reason why everybody's going for tech because see, there's a huge talent shortage in the tech. You can see the HBR review, CNBC, Forbes, everybody's talking about there is a massive tech talent shortage. Even right now, in deep in the pandemic, we are going through a very difficult time. Still, it's very hard to hire good developers. They are not able to find. It is just, you can see so many people are hiring and there is a, always a demand for the right candidate. And pretty much salary says everything, demand and supply, because you can see pretty much top cloud architects are making top dollar. And this is, I will say the median or median salary, um, average salary, and uh, it can go much higher. And of course you start from a very basic, maybe data analytics or a tech support is like 50, 60 K. So it depends upon which phase of a career you are. So that was about talking about technology uh, skills. Let's talk about resume skills. I mean, resume skills, people are well overlook it, but to be very honest, I think everybody, I'm guilty of doing this thing, bombarding resume to the recruiters expecting job will simply land. I mean, how many times you guys have done? I have done it many times. Just sending resume blindly doesn't, I don't even, I didn't even used to change my resume, I'll just send it and let the recruiter figure it out why, which job I'm applying. It doesn't work. Recruiters are very busy and even hiring manager, they don't even look at the resume because they just outsource the job to some recruiter. You have to be very specific which job you're looking for. You have to tailor your resume for each and every job and then send a personalized message. Then you're highly likely to get a call back. If you're just bombarding, nothing is gonna happen because there are millions of resumes that are flooded. Second, I have seen a lot of people do copy paste of resume. Please don't do that. What happens is when you copy paste, something get missed. And you know what? If you are a bad day or a bad luck, during the interview, the, the thing you pasted and you don't know about it, someone might ask you about that thing. And that will be a very embarrassing moment that you don't even know what you have written in your own CV. And that could be disastrous and backfire. And it can actually pretty much disappoint the hiring manager also that he or she, they actually book block their calendar. One hour has been set up, five, six people sitting on a panel, maybe minimum two people. And you come with a copy paste resume and it just, it's a bit turn off for everybody, right? So don't do that, author your own resume and remove anything that you don't know about it. Don't give a talking point to a to hiring manager that you don't even know something. Like for example, someone wrote, okay, I, uh, I'm, I'm a Kafka expert. And something like I deployed something on Kafka. Assume you use this word, you copy paste it someone. Someone say, okay, what you did on a Kafka? And you don't know what, what this word is. I, I have never heard of Kafka. And if you show that, and by the way, right now, all interviews pretty much, they have face-to-face -face via Zoom. They will see your facial expression and they will realize that you don't know about it. So it's a very bad impression. Don't do that. Resume formatting, I will say when you're writing your job description, be a little bit more descriptive. For example, this one bad and a good example, what I talked about is that just giving a one liner, I did something, it doesn't make sense. You have to substantiate with the concrete examples so that people can see, oh, this person actually done it. And while you're using the buzzword in the resume, it's okay, you have to use it, but don't overkill it because it, you shouldn't put a buzzword, you don't know about it. Make sure that it's readable and also you are able to scan the, the, the keyboard density is good. So that was about the, uh, about the resume skills. Now let's talk about online profile. So nowadays in a specifically in right now, I think it's more than ever, the online life has been taken over or maybe completely taken over by our, uh, I mean, online pro has been, it has taken over our real physical life. For example, last time I, when I saw Nicholas face to face, it was, I think, March, right? Pretty much right after that, we got this uh, lockdown and I haven't seen them face to face. So that says that I've been, and uh, we have been working since then, and but I haven't seen him face to face. So what it means that whatever the online image I have about him, that is what the truth is. So you have to make sure you have a very strong and reasonable and a truthful online portfolio, LinkedIn and GitHub. And a lot of people, I see LinkedIn, they don't put their photograph, they haven't used the skill 
section, or maybe they have put some uh, information which is misleading. So don't do that. And LinkedIn is one thing, which is of course good for recruiters, but GitHub is another very good way. You can actually get a job, you can get a call. And long time ago, and not, I'm not sure they do it anymore. At least five, six years ago, Google used to call people based on the what blog posts you wrote. If you write a blog post about something uh, great about technical article, the Google recruitment team will call you and they basically, this is how their hiring was uh, going on. And uh, I also got a call from Google like that. And I was surprised that how can they, if they were they basically, they were indexing the blog and they called based on that. And of course, after a bunch of interview, you have to fly down to the head office. They take one whole day interview that you have to go through the whole process. So the, this is to highlight the, how important is your law, is your port, uh, like online portfolio is. So LinkedIn strategy, I'll talk about copy paste to res, uh, resume to the LinkedIn, create a summary, which actually looks very, uh, I would say very prominent and also uh, highlight your superpower. Superpower, when I what I call superpower as a, out of many things, one skill which stands out, which you do the best, you kill on that thing. You put that over there so that people know that is your primary skill. And always obviously take a professional photo, friendly photographs and put on a, it makes a nice gesture that, okay, this person has, is a trustworthy person and uh, go to the skill section. Just scroll down at the bottom. There is a skill section in LinkedIn and go ahead and add the skill that you think you are good at it. And LinkedIn also has a bunch of uh, tests, assessment. Go ahead and go do those assessment. They actually help to boost your profile. Write a headline, pretty much these type of one of the few examples I use, I see a lot of people use. It seemed to work pretty well. And, and anything I would say, don't overkill it. And then jobs on LinkedIn. Jobs on LinkedIn is pretty, I would say, a most reasonable strategy. You apply a job, you didn't get any reply. Try to find in that company three to five people who are, you think are decision maker. Try to reach out to them in a very friendly way and always be very concise with the message. And always, always address people with their name. Don't say, hey, hi, hello. You know, if you do that without addressing the name, they what they think that it is a copy paste message. And that is a very bad thing that if you are looking for a job and you don't have enough courtesy to type your own message. So please do that and have a concise and always do a spelling check and all those basic things. GitHub strategy. GitHub strategy, I will say, GitHub, you can have as many projects as you want. That is nobody cares, right? But make sure you have at least two to three projects which you can actually showcase as a portfolio project showing your strongest skill up forward. And the project will be very well present, should be very well presented, very well documented in a way that when the interview comes, you are able to talk about that project. And that will be a killer in the interview. And that has actually helped a lot of people to get a job. And a code should be organized so that people, when someone sees your code, they realize, okay, this person has done some real work. So let's talk about interview skills. Maybe I'll take a 30 second break because I know maybe I'm going too fast. I'll give a little bit of space to everybody. Just uh, maybe if you have a question, think of it, make a notes, type one question right now and we can, we will answer at the end. So I'll take it then maybe 30 second break. Okay, let's talk about interview skills. So interview skill, actually, there is a lot of misunderstanding about interview. I had this for longest time in my life that I used to think that technical thing is the key thing. Rest doesn't matter because you are applying for a techie job and really it doesn't matter. Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe uh, some cases it doesn't matter, but most vast majority of the cases, it is actually about not the technical skill is there but they want to know if the person is likable. Because remember, whoever is hiring you, that person will be working with you for 40 hours every week. And 
for a long period of time. Even if you are thinking your work is staying the six months, one year, it is a lot of time you'll be spending with that person. And many times you spend more time with your working colleague than your family members because in, a, in your home, what you're doing, you maybe you wake up at seven o'clock and from nine to five, eight hours, constantly you're working with that person. And after that, maybe you have some time, couple of hours with the family, then you sleep. So if you see in your whole 24 hour life, actually 40 hours is a huge amount of time you are, you, are, you are spending with that person. So they are also inherently, they don't say it, nobody is written and they don't even know that they are doing it. But unknowingly is a human nature. You want to do something that, okay, two people, you, you are interviewed, both were technically equally good. One person you like more, they will obviously hire that person. This goes without saying, right? It is, and what they are saying, they are not looking for a likely, likable person being, you know, some kind of a who can crack a joke or something. They talk, They are looking for very basic fundamental feature of any human being. Be nice, be helpful, be open. And anytime you don't know, ask for help. If you're able to demonstrate these things, that's it. That's it. Because anyways, you, you will be working online with them. Nobody's going to go, we'll go to work nowadays. Pretty much all work from home. So just keep these things in mind. And also make them excited about you, what you have worked so far. And if they see there is a, some kind of synergy, what is your passion and what is actually your, uh, your project, how it can help in their organization, that will be a killer. And this is what happens. So getting a job offer is all about making people feel good around you rather than being, oh, I'm so smart technically. And the moment they see there is an arrogancy, you are done because nobody wants to hire an arrogant person who is going to create more problem in the team, right? Nobody wants. So few of the techniques that I have seen it works, make, first of all, highlight your unique expertise, show your super skill, whatever you are strongest. If you are strongest in Python, show that your Python capability. If you're stronger in maybe on a, on a, some kind of a tool, maybe you are stronger in the snowflake. I know everything about snowflake. And if you can demonstrate that, that is pretty good. And you pitch it and you show that how your that skill will actually turn down into a solving a problem for that particular team. When I say business impact mean, of course, they're not hiring you for a CEO or anything, but if they are hiring for a smaller team, if you can demonstrate that how you can be valuable for that team, that goes a long way. So I think these are the few things to keep in mind. And one example, I always talk about one of my students, what they did was he built a monitoring platform. And a lot of people don't want to do that because it's, it is a tough project. And, but that actually project paid off because in the interview process, I think discussion went to something in the monitoring and he was able to talk about that project. And they were so impressed. It just interview went on for like one hour about that. And because he did that project by himself, he didn't forget anything. That is, I think I will talk about as active learning and all this thing, because he did, he didn't have to memorize anything. He knew what he did and he went through the whole process and they were very impressed. Even though the monitoring thing would have what he did in their company, they had something completely different, maybe better solution. They didn't care, but what they liked that if someone has worked in the monitoring they have done, it gives a feeling that this person knows how a production system works. This person knows what is the pain point our team might face. And that is what we're going to take this guy, even though it, it is a, he did similar work, maybe it is not usable, but the intent of the project was so powerful that landed him the job. So that is very important aspect always to think about it. And we'll talk about later on about the powerful story. So that actually comes back to the same thing. Like once they think this person gets the job done and you get hired. And now when I was talking about the monitoring platform thing, it actually takes me to the next section of the, which is the most important feature of it, a powerful story. And what is a story? Story is actually when you go to an interview, right? If you are a fresher, so they will ask you about your college project. That is a very traditional approach, what you did in the project. 
if you have passed maybe 10 years ago, maybe you, you did your education, maybe 2012, and I don't know, you were doing something else and you have nothing to talk about. So what it will be your story? Unless you are an experienced person, then of course they will ask what you did in the last job. You don't have those tools. You need to have something to demonstrate that, yes, I am ready for the market. I'm ready to solve your problem. So to solve that problem, a lot of people do that. What they do, they do some kind of internship. And what I've seen, these are all futile internship, pretty much doing from the community college, just say a template project, you do that. The problem with that project, there's no, nothing problem with the project. Problem is the intent with the project. For example, if you want to become a front-end developer, of course, you will create a like a React application, right? That makes sense. But when you do the React application, you must know every nitty gritty of the detail and you must be able to explain the project, why you choose React, why you did this, why you did that. The problem what I've seen pretty much like a couple of months back, I was trying to hire a web developer and they were all actually, mostly they did some kind of project. And what I saw, first of all, pretty much most had like a, maybe same or similar project, that is, that is fine, that is okay. The problem was that, okay, if I ask, why did you choose React? Nobody had answer. They said, okay, because it gave me. It doesn't work like, you have to explain the, what is the problem, what problem you're trying to solve. Then basically I went to the project, I said, let, let's, let's pull your GitHub profile, let's see what did you do. And within five to 10 minutes you realize they didn't do anything on the project. Possibly they were not, but the mentor was not motivated enough because in most cases, what happens is that you did your uh, seven course and now you have five months of project. Mentor says, okay, do the project, come back whenever you just run the button. Okay, I can see the website. Okay, bye. So with that kind of approach, what happens is that you did a project for three months actually, but you wasted the whole time. And during that time, the whole idea about the project is about being an active learner being a project-based learner. If you're not doing any active learning, you're just doing something for the sake of it, you're wasting your time. And that is why a lot of time people say they did an internship, it has no value. Because two things are the most critical. The internship, the mentor never had a vested interest for your success. First, second is that the project that you did, it doesn't align with your actual career goal. If these two things are not matching, please do not do such internship. It is a waste of time. Even if it is free, it is costing you more money than anything you, you, you think you're, if you consider your time is free, of course, go and waste your time. But I, but I think, I mean, most people would agree. Time is an invaluable thing. The time pass is gone. It's never going to come back. So don't waste your time in such a futile internship. So, when I'm talking about internship, I want to just give another coming back to the same analogy of car. If your car is broken, whom will you fix? So see, so employer, similarly, employer doesn't really care about what you did, to be very honest. What they care about that, how you can help them in their project, right? And if you can demonstrate that your project is exactly how you're going to help that, that person or that company or a team, that is where it gets. For example, you get a two person, right? On a the same example, I'm giving your card is broken. Two person came. One person says, oh, I have academic knowledge. I just read the book. Everything is fine. I know everything, but you realize that person hasn't fixed any car. Another person says, says, see, actually you are driving a Toyota, but you know, I have fixed a similar situation in, Mer uh, in the Mercedes like last month. And it was a similar, you explained. There were like something going on with the engine, some spark plug was not working and I was able to do this and I fixed it. It gives you feeling, okay, if this guy can do on a Mercedes and he's able to demonstrate that he has done something, maybe he can fix, help me. And because you have two options, of course you will choose the better one and you will hire. And if you are able to demonstrate that the second thing, that a correlation, how your project is somehow related to existing one and that is what is the killer story. So I'm talking about if you're building a project, something like that, like for example, okay, I know Terraform, I know Ansible, I know AWS, 
but what you did with that, that is the key. Even this is a very simple project like WordPress. Everybody has heard of WordPress. But actually doing this full automation, it could take up to a week to prepare this demo, by the way. So if you have done all these things and if you can explain what was the role of each and every component, that is the killer. Another one I'll say, maybe uh, you are working for a data migration project. If you can explain exactly what you did, you set up a PG SQL, set up a replication, it's pretty much, it's not that straightforward. And if you can showcase that exactly this is, this is what I did, it is a very powerful story. And this reminds me another person I was talking to, he was, uh, I think he was, uh, was, I was looking for someone to basically, we had a small POC on a cloud migration. I asked him, okay, uh, have you done any? He said, yeah, yeah, I've done cloud migration. He named one of the community college. And I said, okay, what you did on that? I said, I did a cloud migration of a website. I said, wow, uh, what you did? I he said, I migrated the website and the database. I said, how did you migrate the database? Say, I took the database and migrated it. I mean, how can you migrate? So it means that person, he didn't do anything. He just didn't do anything. He just don't understand that database migration. You don't migrate the database. You actually migrate the data. The database is already there. So he was trying to explain me that I actually took and put the data over, I mean, with the database. It's like, it's like some kind of a, I don't know, maybe some kind of a, a tangible object. You take it and put it over there. It doesn't work like that. Database migration means you are migrating the data, not the database. How can you do, unless you are actually cloning the data, the, putting the whole thing. But the ideal way of the cloud migration is that you basically migrate the data into a managed service and then let the managed service managing it. There is no point taking the database and putting over there. So these things, it means you have never done it and possibly maybe maybe this is how that person who or the mentor was he or she actually suggested to do that way and which nobody does in the industry maybe they do in the community college just to get the exam done but you don't do that in real world and that actually it backfires these kind of projects so i will say don't do that kind of futile project that can actually backfire and the most important talking about about the story is that what I emphasize on pretty much I do everything, whatever I've learned in my whole life pretty much using this is active learning. It means project-based learning, it means learning while you are doing it. So for example, um, I, I mean, pretty much we deal with this a uh, lot of cases, right? Okay, I learned, maybe I learned something on a Python and next month I learned something new. And what happened next month? I forgot what I learned. I just don't remember whatever I did. Why this happens? Because what happens is that you learn something, you do some hello world program, some sample program, and you forget about it. Because why? Because all the exercises that, that you did, they always used to work. So you never had to pressure your brain to learn something and go dig deeper into it. But if you do a project on that particular thing, and when I'm talking project, I'm talking a real project, which will take time, which will take very troubleshooting here and there, and with that whole pain, when you deliver the project, you will never ever for, forget the project. If you ask me right now in past my 15 years, from first job to this job, I can explain every goddamn project that I did. Every project I can explain. Of course, I cannot talk in the public right now, but if someone asks, I can explain exactly what I did. Of course, I, I, I won't remember the exact code, but I know what I did. I went through, even when I'm talking, actually all the picture memory is going back to my days, like how I delivered the first, like I used to work for basically embedded system company, how we delivered the first smart card application, first smart uh, debit credit application, the ATM application. And this, it just comes to my mind because those projects were very, very challenging for me at that particular time. And it took months, months to deliver it. So it will be always be with you. You will never forget. So that whole idea of, you know, you explain someone, go to the previous project and they say, ah, sorry, I don't know. I have to brush up. It means you just memorize. You never did on your own. If you did something on your own by doing it, you will never forget it. So this is what the main emphasis I put on. So yeah, I think I, I talked a lot right now, a lot of tips. Let's, let's do a quick recap before we actually do something. So quick recap, that focus on the real tech skills rather than the buzzword. Don't chase the buzzword, they keep changing. Build well-written and honest resume, author your own resume. 
build sound online presence, be likable during interview and have a powerful story by active learning, not just by downloading a code and doing some hello world kind of program. So now all this thing you do and the biggest thing I think pretty much everybody's here for that. Okay, enough is enough. Tell me how to land a tech job. So I think that part now Nicholas will take you through this. For sure. Yeah. Thanks, Randon. I'll just share my screen here. She just need to update my position in the presentation. One second. There we go. I hope everybody can see my screen. And if not, please, of course, let me know. So uh, yeah, I've been talking to, we of course been, um, you know, working with students for a quite a while um, and always kind of updating our model for how to best, uh, you know, kind of get into the field. Chandon has said a lot of stuff tonight that are, you know, things that you're going to want to have, you know, um, boxes that you're going to want to check to get in the field. So that could definitely seem overwhelming to people. And uh, no doubt, if you're somebody who doesn't have an internet experience, you don't have a network and all these other things, you're probably thinking to yourself like, well, either I can't do this, the door is closed, or um, man, like there's a lot of complexity here. And so this, the rest of the talk is going to kind of be about what we found to be the optimal strategy for cutting through that complexity and kind of overcoming some of the things that you might be surprised that you actually can overcome. You know, if you haven't worked on an enterprise grade project before, there's a way around that. You know, there's, a, there's ways around everything. And it's kind of the optimistic light of the tunnel, I guess, of the, um, the kind of the talk where we've told people a lot of the things you need to do is that it's not something that has to take forever and it's not something that's impossible. So kind of, you know, with, with saying that, um, so kind of, you know, we've helped quite a lot of people break into the field. Field. Um, these are some of our success stories, kind of showing some, some testimonials here, um, some good, some really good uh, classes we've had. And so, yeah, so we've created a Journey to Become Tech Professional program. This is sort of a, this is our kind of canonical beginning program for people who want to get into the field. Uh, we do have two other programs that are basically aimed at people who are already in the field and they want to make the transition to a higher level. So I'm going to kind of go through all of that now. Um, so basically the idea for the program that we looked at is that um, Chandon, being in the position to hire people for teams, um, you know, in a lot of cases, he's working with senior people and he's going to want senior people on his teams. Um, when they go to hire for a junior position, what they're going to want to do is they're going to take up some, they're going to consider some aspect of, you know, what they're doing on the day to day. And maybe, you know, a couple, maybe a couple different aspects that are not too, too challenging. They're going to package those up into smaller requirement positions. And then they're going to try to find someone who's junior who can take care of that. You know, they can kind of take weight off their shoulders. So they don't have to do so much mechanical stuff and they can kind of stay at the, the higher levels of the, uh, of the whatever they're trying to build because you know that it's kind of like up there having that experience you can't really that comes with experience right you can't just kind of teach people how to build a full system you have to kind of teach them lower level parts of the system and they work their way up so okay so he's taking some part of what he's doing and he's going to try then to like create a, a job that someone who's more junior can do for him so we you know we we're talking about this quite a lot and like what would be the signals really clearly that would tell a person, you know, would tell you a person could do this. So on the one hand, of course, if they have all the things we talked about tonight, they've worked on another project, you know, they have that experience, they can come in, they have a powerful story that kind of really says they can do the job. Well, then that's a no brainer, right? It's very easy. You just say, oh, that person clearly like some part of my job, let's say I have, you know, I have to do five different things throughout a week and uh, I want to get one, uh, somebody to do one of those things for me. If that person clearly has done it before, well, it's, it's no brainer to hire that person. But if another, if, if, you know, one of the things I do want to kind of point out is that there is not enough people in tech. There is more demand than there is supply. Um, you know, Harvard and Accenture, uh, Harvard and Accenture Consulting just did a a report called Bridge the Gap, where they talked about um, kind of how much tech talent they need in the US. And then of course, that's going to apply to Canada as well. And so it's, it's just huge, right? So in a lot of cases, you're not going to get a person coming in being like, well, I have, a, I have an enterprise um, level uh, project experience, I have all this code, you're going to get somebody else, right? Somebody's trying to break into the field. And so what would be the signal that you would really say, okay, this person, someone I'm going to give a shot to, you know what I mean? Um, you have to try people out on your team. And of course, there can be false positives, try somebody on your team, and it doesn't work out. But what would like, you know, let that person get in the door. And realistically, it would be it's a lot of, it's a lot of project based learning, right? If someone has a project that even though it's not like a full commercial enterprise grade project, but it has a project that shows that they understand the context, and you can probably get them up to speed, they can learn fast enough, then then you can start to trust them, really, it's going to come down to like, what they can show you that they've done on GitHub, which kind of validates 
their story that they're telling you, right? Like, oh, I did this project. Okay, great. Let me see the code. Well, wow, that code's great. Was that your code? And then they explain why they made the decisions they did, how they built the projects. And then you know, it's their code. And then you say, I'm going to give this person a shot, right? This is not, I don't think there's a lot more to it than that. I think Shannon covered a lot of the things that are really pitfalls. You know, if you have a terrible picture on um, LinkedIn, well, then maybe people are going to pass you over because they assume that you don't maybe take care of yourself or you don't have the awareness that, you know, engaging with people in this, this social capacity is something that's important. So as long as you're not making these pitfalls and you have the store and you have, you know, things to back it up, then there's a really good chance you can get a shot. So we said, okay, right. It, it really does come down to the projects and being able to tell a story about the project. Great. So then, you know, you can kind of work backwards from like, what jobs do we know are in demand. So for example, cloud engineer, everybody coming here tonight, experience, not experience, talking about cloud. I want to move into cloud. I want to learn cloud. And like that, that makes a lot of sense, right? We all were pushed into kind of like staying at home, doing more remote things. Well, a lot of us were with COVID. Everybody starts engaging through applications that are more connecting them through the internet, right? So obviously that's putting more of a demand on cloud. You know, this is just, this is just one thing I'm talking about, but cloud is, it's, it's everywhere, right? Like all the computing is going to the cloud and stuff. Anyways, so, um, so yeah, so people, so people want to learn cloud, right? So that's, so they want to have projects around that. So you can kind of say, well, what are the key skills that people can use to make these projects? It's just, it's just a process of working backwards, right? You want to signal to people that you can get, do a job, they should give you a shot. Okay, what are the projects that are going to do that? And then what are the skills that you need to make those projects? I'm kind of being very long-winded about this, but I feel like when I tell this to people, it's, it can be kind of quite surprising for them that you have to just work backwards from job postings. So this is what we did. You know, we went out, we found a bunch of job postings and we said, okay, is this, um, we read this, the, a part of that Bridge the Gap by Harvard and Accenture is also that um, in a lot of cases, this is, um, the report was looking at jobs that have high, much higher than average earnings potential, have a lot of upwards career growth, that they also don't need a four-year college, um, a formal college or university education to get into, um, that you, if you have enough training, you can just kind of get in, right? So we kind of were looking around trying to find out things that may or may not have CS degrees, and we're not affiliated with this company at all. They're up in Ottawa. I, have, I don't know anything about them, to be honest. And But they're saying, you know, whether you have a CS degree or not. And so this kind of holds true in a lot of ways. Like people may have CS degrees, they may not. They may not have a lot of experience, they may, but they you can get into these jobs even if you don't have them. So that was pretty great. So then we also thought like, okay, given this, if you have a skill set that will let you build up some projects, could we have it so that it's not just cloud engineering jobs that you'd be going out for that you could diversify a little bit. Now, obviously it comes, you have to have a kind of skill for tweaking your resume to make sure that you're applying, that you're, um, that you're, you know, contextualizing what you've done in a way that you're suggesting to the person who reads your resume, like this is a good candidate, right? So we kind of found that these core skills, they're not very buzzwordy skills, but they're very much skills that you could probably com compress what you need to know into a certain kind of small subset of skills that would let you go after a whole bunch of different jobs. And this is kind of the secret thing. A lot of people are saying like, hey, come to my data science bootcamp and I'll teach you how to learn TensorFlow. And like, I'm, I'm a certified TensorFlow developer, right? Like I, I love it, but that's not, that's not the skill that's most important to my, you know what I mean? To like my position as a developer, um, that's actually like very far from it. So there's all these, these buzzwords, but they're really not what you should be chasing. Uh, you want to get the core things that will then let you do kind of everything. So anyway, so yep. So we kind of, we created a program where we basically did this. Like, let's just, as quickly as possible, we're going to get people learning these, these primary foundational skills. We're going to do active learning as soon as we can, which ends up being a lot of um, guided question answer based stuff. So again, for the new people in here, like if you were to join us on the program, we would basically teach you just enough so that you could start answering questions on your, on your own. And it would be a daily project or daily process where you bring more code, more things you're trying to work on, and we're gonna help you with through that. And so basically we, we do this, pro this process of active learning until you can actually program, and then we get you on the projects. And then once you've done the projects, like that's it, you've, you've pretty much got it. We get you at the door um, towards the field. We're gonna give you the, you know, the interview um, support, the resume support, and um, the kind of the other thing that I really want to highlight for all the experienced people here tonight is that if you are looking to like transition, if you already have a lot of skills, then you, we know that you can learn technical stuff in a very fast way. Like you're already able to do that. So this is kind of the second leg of our program is that Chandon's specialty is more for senior DevOps skills. We have divine, does a, a developed program that's kind of at the lower level to be very good for the beginners. But like, if you are someone who wants to learn senior DevOps skills, senior cloud skills, become a cloud architect, um, definitely get in touch with us. Like these are the kind of things, the skills that will take you from, you know, 70, 80 a year to over a hundred a year. Um, and that's kind of the core group of people that we start off working with. So yeah, so we can, you know, we can really help you in that direction. 
Um, so basically, again, for kind of for everyone that comes to the program, it's a training phase where basically we just teach you because you have to have the information, but it's active. It's going to be active learning as much as possible. That's super, super important. Like I would much rather spend 30 minutes telling someone uh, about something and then 30 minutes of them kind of struggling through problems that they can't answer than, you know, 50 minutes of me telling them everything, showing them how to solve the project, then 10 minutes of us feeling good together that they've copied my code. And then I see them tomorrow and they repeat the same thing. And then, you know, two months later, they know absolutely nothing. It's much better if the person's struggling for 50% of it. And I'm trying to like guide them through how, how to think about things. Cause we all feel, we all feel really, we like to congratulate ourselves when we solve a problem. Right? whether that's at our jobs or something we learn, we really like that feeling of solving a problem. What nobody really likes is the struggle, but the struggle is where you learn everything. It's where you learn things that you won't forget. And the whole program is designed around having people that are gonna help you struggle and like encourage you to struggle and like kind of praise you for your struggles as, as opposed to praising you for your successes. Right. So anyways, so as soon as we get that done, we go to the internship phase, which internship phase is it's the project building phase, but it's also, we're also going to treat it like, um, you know, so basically we, use, we do agile methodology. So um, basically it's going to be like daily scrums. This is a lot of stuff that you're going to be doing in the industry. So if you come and you're, you're coming to work with us, you can also say like, hey, not only do I have these projects, but I also was working in like a, a you know, kind of like a, a, a live production environment. Essentially it's a mock live production environment, but you'll still have a good story to tell about how you had to present your code every day, how you're accountable, how you did code reviews. These are all kind of industry standards that we also try to follow. So we give people the, the experience of working in the industry. And then as soon as we know that people have these uh, these projects under the belt, then um, you know we send you out, we give you, it's funny because we send people out and they'll come back and they'll say, wow, like they actually asked the exact questions they said, you said they were gonna ask and that I was prepared and that felt really good and that everybody you know kind of feels good about that. So yeah, these are kind of three phases. Um, it is, it's a lot of, it's, it's video, but the thing is, it's every single day you will have one hour. So if you join the program every single day, you'll have one hour where you are presenting your code. And I think that's the most critical part and you'll be accountable every day. And this is a really healthy thing, like, like in, in a nice way, like obviously in a job they're paying you. So if you don't do what you have to do, it's really bad. But in our program, you're going to be accountable in a way that like, we're going to want to see how far you got. And then the next day you come out, you show us how far you got the next day. And it kind of keeps the ball rolling in a really positive way. And nobody's obviously going to be mean about anything, but it really, I know for myself, when I have code to show the next day, like, I work a lot harder and I try to get a lot more done. So there's that. And then, um, yeah, so this is kind of just a, a survey, the same survey about people talking about how cloud skills um, improve their careers. And these are people already in the industry all the way up to, um, you know, C-level uh, executives. So I, we, you know, pretty confident that cloud is going to be really helpful for people. Uh, we also, so this is kind of a breakdown of the program a little bit, but one of the things we note is that there's obviously a fee to the program, but after, um, you pay the fee, which is a monthly fee, then you're in the program until you get a job. So, you know, we're very motivated. We very much want people to get jobs. It helps us, it helps you, it's good for everybody. Um, you know, this isn't one of those programs like a college program, for example, where it's like, okay, come for a couple of semesters. If you learn something, great. If you didn't learn anything, well, that's okay. Even, well, I mean, even if you learn something, if you can't get a job, like we'll see you later. Thank you for your money, see you later. In this, you kind of, you can stay with us, you can keep getting your support. Um, and we'll keep invest being invested in your future until you get something. And we can only do that because we're pretty confident that the system works and you can get you can get things for sure. Um, so yeah, so these are kind of just the different programs that we have. Uh, the journey to tech professional is very much for people who want to break in. Um, so you can go after software developer, software testing, and uh, tech and app support. Um, and all of these are, of course, like they're careers that have a lot of upwards mobility. So once you get one of these careers, you're gonna be strengthening your skills and you get in the field. And that's just, we wanna get people in the field as fast as we can. Um, of course, we've got the data professional and uh, I know people, data's huge. Data's making, you know, big waves everywhere. So we can help people, you know, go from whatever they happen to know now to kind of, um, let's say rounding off the rough edges of everything you need to know to start going to interview for data positions. And then of course, cloud engineer and especially DevOps and senior DevOps. If you want to learn, you know, if you want to learn advanced Kubernetes or Ansible or any of these things, um, we're really happy to help people learn those. And let's, let's see. Yep. So Journey to Tech. This is or Journey to Tech. This is kind of just the uh, some of the the this is kind of the course curriculum and one of the, a lot of the things that we really focus on for people. This is what we found to um, this. These are from what we understand about the industry, the skills that people they they just they need more of them. Um, kind of simply put, they're not flashy skills, but they're skills that kind of you can apply everywhere, especially as you kind of understand how the whole system goes together, you know, like model, uh, model 
uh, or sorry, client server architecture and how data is going to be flowing through the systems and things like that. You can just see how, you know, for example, Linux, um, most commercial systems are going to be using Linux and open source. So if you know that you, you're just your ability to go for jobs is just so much higher. So, um, yeah. And so it's, it takes, we we're finding that it takes about three months for people to go from, you know, maybe having a little bit of experience, a little bit of context to up to the point where they have um, projects in their GitHub. And uh, that's, it's a pretty intense pro uh, process, but it, you know, it can be done. Of course, it depends on how quickly people learn and how fast they work and stuff like that. So it can take a little bit longer, but it, it is doable in a fairly short amount of time. Um, yep. Yeah, so this is kind of, this is the things that we focus on for DevOps at cloud. Um, yeah. So just much more advanced stuff. And um, it, people we found, sometimes we found in the past that people will try to come directly into this program. You know, they're going to try to go and they're going to try to learn advanced Linux without being very strong in Linux in the first place. Um, you know, and they'll learn Kubernetes when they're not really sure about the context and how that's all going to work out for them. And um, that is not, that's just something that isn't very um, time effective for people. It's much better if you start you, if you start kind of with the basics and then you try to add on the advanced buzzwords on top of that, that's really the way to go. So, you know, we're pretty, we, if you want to get into this program, we do require people to have experience and know what they're talking about. And then we can kind of just like, you know, fill in the gaps in your resume, help you do that so that you can go after a job that's, you know, six figure plus for sure. And uh, yep, yeah, journey data uh, professional, so uh, this is going to be, it's going to be a lot of Python and it's going to be kind of the introduction to tech one and it's going to add on a bunch of data stuff. This program will take a little bit longer, but um, we do find that a lot of people in data are not as strong as Py with Python as they probably should be. So we, we need to take a bit of time to get people up to speed on Python, like almost to be like software developer. So software developers, you know, there's a lot I can say about this, but they, um, they have to write very clean, very maintainable, robust code. You don't need to do get to that level, but you do have to be able to um, automate a lot of your workflow and save yourself a lot of time. And like, just whenever you come up to something, you're like, oh, I need to reformat some data. Like just running a Python script should just be at, kind of at the tip of your fingertips. So um, yeah, that's kind of what we do. And then we add on all the data stuff on top of that. Um, people who I would say just know data and cannot program at all. Um, the problem with that is that most projects only need maybe like one data person per 10 to 20 other people, whether that's operations people, developers, DevOps, what have you. Um, yeah, you just don't need as many of them because they're, you know, they're in, in a sense, they're kind of gaining the insight, but you need the rest of the people gathered around them, at least for now, to make the project possible. So if you don't have that flexibility, um, there's a, and there's a lot of data scientists out there. There's for some reason that's one of the things that people really thought they could teach quite easily. And so the kind of spectrum from data analyst, like you know, being able to use Excel all the way up to data scientist, like have a PhD in machine learning. Um, that's not like employers know what that is, but oftentimes people trying to get into the field don't realize that spectrum's there and how much each each kind of team needs, or, or really I should say how few data science data scientist teams really need. So if you want to have more of a chance in a job opportunity and you're already a person who's really interested in data, learn some programming as well. And we'll teach you that, but um, it can, that can be the takeaway whether you join us or not, learn some programming. And uh, so yeah, this is kind of the post, post training. Um, so after you've got your projects going, you can tell us a story. Uh, you know, we do, we can do retraining as necessary, continue the project work if necessary, interview preparation, targeted job search. So, you know, each, each job you're going to want to curate your resume a little bit towards it and uh, resume building with people. Uh, we, uh, we are doing, we're kind of having fun with some of the students right now where um, we will get them to come in and give us kind of like a brief synopsis of, um, yeah, kind of a brief synopsis of some question that's very common in interviews. Like just describe to me big O notation and they don't know it before. They haven't, they don't know big O notation before. So what we want to do is have everybody have a baseline kind of like being able to talk about all of these different things. And then as you go out for specific jobs, we can ramp up and we can kind of deepen your knowledge, give you resources, deepen your knowledge in some direction. So if you're going developer, you're going to have to know quite a lot more about big no O notation than how to just talk about it. And some, what are the, some of the running times of common algorithms, right? You're going to have to go deep in it. You're probably going to have to solve some questions and you're also going to have to be able to tell the time complexity of that, right? But, but first thing you should be able to do is if we say to you, like, you know, what's the purpose of DevOps and you're going for a DevOps thing, you need to be able to talk in a fairly convincing, confident way about just what the top level purpose of DevOps is so that we know 
at a, at a very base, you know what you're talking about. So we've kind of been developing this skill and interview a part of this kind of a niche area of interview prep is having be able people able to give confident answers to very common questions. That's those are going to be some of the things that they're going to be like just early filters to knock you out. You know, you get in there and they're going to ask you a bunch of questions about just like very stuff that has to be common. You might know the answers. We had one student know exactly what the answer was. It took him three minutes to get it out and it really should have been just like one sentence. And he knew exactly what he's talking about, but we, we kind of in a very nice way said like that, that wouldn't have worked in an interview. You would have disqualified yourself by just by your inability to just communicate that idea. And this is something that we can practice with people, right? So because Shannon has hired so many people, we can really basically put you through the filter of unhirability before you actually get to the interview. And I promise you that because we're on your side, we'll be a lot nicer than the feeling of just, you know, not being in interviews, and not getting jobs. Like it's, it, that would just be horrible. It's brutal. Right. So um, because we will come in and tell you, Hey, you wouldn't have got hired today in a very nice way. We'll see you tomorrow. Um, that's, it's a good place to be, you know, especially if you actually want to make this happen for yourself. Cool. So yeah, placement. Um, I think I've covered most of this. Uh, you know, LinkedIn strategies, good things like that. Uh, we've had some really good results that within uh, three months we've get eighty, but eighty percent. Six is ninety-one, and uh, within a year, all of our students get placed. Uh, the job market is, um, you know, again, like you don't have to take it from me. You can take it from Harvard and Accenture, and you can read Bridging the Gap if you'd like to just kind of know that it is a supply demand. Well, it's you know, it's a it's a demand heavy market for technology and people who can do things. So if you're one of the select few that actually can do things, then you you'll get a job. That's pretty much it. And uh, yeah, some of our past students just, we kind of make this point that we have students come in who have technical backgrounds and we have students come in who have non-technical backgrounds and it is it is definitely possible to do. Um, and uh, yep, so I can, we do self-paced videos, we have Slack channel, we do live classroom every day. Um, and then we have one-on-one -on -one internship project placement. Uh, so we do have a one week money back guarantee some people I know will offer like two months or whatever. That's really only if they're only doing pre-recorded video. And no doubt, if you have a course that takes two months to complete and you give one month for people to sample the course and it's all pre-recorded video, then your return rate is only going to be, your refund rate is only going to be on people who drop out in the first week because they never got into it in the first place, right? Um, we're not doing that. We have like one to two hours of live classes every day that people can come in and we're going to analyze your code with you. So if you do join the program, you have like basically five to 10 hours of our time to figure out if it's right for you. And this is like a lot of time that we're actually going to do this every single day with people. And we, we I honestly really do enjoy the process of pe seeing people get better and get ready for the industry. So, you know what I mean? That's why it's not a two month guarantee. It's a one, one week. Cause it's still, it's, it's much more of my time than you're going to get with a pre-recorded video session. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of, that's something that I would encourage people to do if you'd like. Um, and also I'm always open to um, setting up a phone call with people. If you'd like to discuss if the program's right for you and just kind of any concerns you have. And so, um, I think I've covered this stuff. So right now we are doing it for, um, we're doing it for $500 a month and it's for three months. We're actually not doing the absolute beginner. This was something that we, we thought we need before, but we've got enough students now that we're actually kind of comfortable with the way things are working for us. And uh, we can do it. We're just doing it for, it's just three months flat, beginner, advanced person, whatever it is, it's $500 a month. And after that, you're just in the program, you have access to the program and our time until you get a, a job. So really think about like our confidence level that we can place you given that, right? So it's, um, we're also doing it as well that if people would prefer to do $300 a month for or five months, we can definitely accommodate that. We had a couple of people asking, you know, every, a lot of things are in flux right now. And we understand that people on the one hand have more time maybe than they did before to learn things. And they're very excited about the potential of really getting to where they want to be, but maybe they have less money than they did before. So that maybe, you know, reducing cash flow things and going down to just $300 a month. And we, we're pretty, you know, I think that any, if anybody wants to do this and you know, you're at all financially stable, then $300 a month is something that's very doable. So um, yeah, that's pretty much, that's, that's our program. And we can leave it open for Q and A now. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else I really want to stress about the program. Um, I'm really, I had a formal education and I think that if I had been in a situation where I could have had more active learning, including if this is informal education, a lot of people say I had my formal education, I got my PhD, but it didn't, it doesn't matter at all to me. Um, you know, there's a truthness and a falseness there because the PhD does kind of train you to do a lot of things and that's important. But I think that a lot of formal education is going to be not very active learning. It's going to be passive learning, you know, learn these little things and then maybe do a really just an absolute, um, the absolute minimum project that 
an instructor can feel acceptable about having given it to you. Like they're not, I think the amount of training and kind of um, the amount of focus that people have to give individual attention on students to actually watch like and find out what level they're at. So the way we manage this is basically we'll do, um, you know, we can do a big room and then we'll have students come in. And then if I know a student has a concept solved, I'll help that student solve the other one. So both people are getting active learning. Right. So the one person will be trying to solve the program, the like, so, you know, writing the, the code and whatever it is, and the other person will be helping them do that. And so, you know, obviously you're going to learn so much through teaching and the other person who's first learning kind of for the first time or at least struggling through it, they're still doing active learning. Right. And so this is kind of like the structure of, of, of linking people up like this. Um, yeah. So I guess in, in short, I wish I had a lot more active learning in my past. I think I would have been a lot stronger. And I think that honestly, I probably learned 90% of what actually matters to me after I left school, as opposed to while I was in it. Um, and, you know, the theoretical concepts that I learned that were helpful from school could probably be condensed down to, you know, a couple months tops. So yeah, that's kind of just something I'll say about the program. Uh, we've got some good questions here. And I'm, I know I'm, I am going on a lot about this. But uh, we also have a really good group tonight. So thank you so much for everybody who's still hanging out. Um, I hope that some of you I really wish everyone like the best of luck and that I hope that like if you're here and you're trying to make some kind of moves that you're successful in those. Absolutely, especially in these kind of um, trying times. So let's see. How long has this program been going for? So our program has been going for about a year now. Um, Channon has placed like basically working through working with other programs in the States. He's been doing it for a very long time. And uh, if Shannon, if you're still on, you, I'll let you speak to that. But he's he's helped train and place thousands of people through agencies in the States. So um, we do have a lot of experience doing that, but our current program has been going on for about a year. And uh, how many how many graduates? Um, it's a good question. I'm not sure how many graduates off the top of my head. And uh, is is there a certificate or something we can show an employer? Yeah, we can, we, we can provide you a certificate. And, uh, but again, uh, be very honest, the certificate is not going to get you a job. Certificate is usually good for someone who already has a job and they want to maybe get a promotion or something that will, so we will definitely provide a certificate and any reference call that you may need. Um, but from a, from a learning perspective is, is, uh, we try to basically make you able so that you can uh, be, be successful, whatever the goal you are looking for. But currently we specialize on three streams as Nicholas explained. One is a tech, which is generic, like the entry level software developer, tech support. One is a bit senior, mid to senior level cloud engineer. And another is a, I will say entry to mid level of a data engineer, Python data engineer. And by the way, data engineer is a big, big word is uh, the one whole gamut of developers are actually Java developers. <clears throat> but I guess uh, Java development, you cannot learn in uh, like a three months of period to land a job. You may land a very entry level Java job, but uh, the data engineering is completely different beast. So that's why the Python we do heavily and we heavily focus on the data technologies, which is going on in the market right now. So I hope that answered uh, something to show. Yeah, yeah, for, we will be there. So you will have a certificate, uh, a reference call, email, whatever you want. Everything is available to show the employer. The nice thing is that if we're doing a lot of project-based learning and we can see that you can complete the projects, then we can endorse you, you know, really wholeheartedly because we know you can actually complete the job that the employer is considering you for. So it's pretty, pretty nice. Um, something about uh, which bot you mentioned to beat for buzzwords. Yep, that question that question is a good one because it's completely stumped me. So, <laughs> which bot you mentioned to beat for buzzwords? Maybe if you can elaborate on what that that question is. Um, and I'll, I, in my head, I, I'm imagining an artificial like I'm imagining a machine learning uh, chatbot that is trying to beat buzzwords, but I don't think that's what you mean. Okay. Um, Person is off. How can you prepare himself for the next job, or he or she needs to go to their comfort and update the resume with different technologies? So, just from a user Galaxy S9, um, I hope we've covered that. If we didn't sufficiently cover your question, 
um, feel free to like ask about any parts that you're still not clear on and we can definitely go over that again. Um, yeah, I think that Shannon mentioned a whole bunch of things that are really important to have and a whole bunch of things that you want to avoid doing. And then I've hopefully explained the structure at which you can achieve, you know, both of those and the way that, you know, we provide that to students um, to, you know, explain in full detail of how to do that would of course take the length of the program, which is about three months. So we can't do that, of course, in a one hour webinar. But uh, really good questions and thank you for the questions. Yeah, so just asking how many um, hours per week do you need to dedicate? And is it similar to a, a boot camp style uh, general coding? Um, I haven't been to boot camp style once, but if there is a lot of active learning, then I would say yes. I do know that one of the differences, of course, is boot camps are 15,000 and they're full time. Um, this is not the same. This is not the same situation. Um, we are going to be with you for a certain amount of time per day and we're going to give you um, enough work that you can either keep yourself occupied full time or part time. You can do it in part time, but again, it does like these come down to the individual efforts and the learning rates of the people involved. So to guarantee you that you're going to be able to achieve this in, um, you know, three months, if you just do part time, you would have to be um, probably have some experience beforehand, but I still think it would be doable. Uh, what coding languages do we cover? Um, so there's kind of the, we're going to start off with Python for sure. We're going to do Linux. And then depending on what experience you have coming in to the uh, course, we will probably, we'll definitely give you some specialization for the jobs that you're interested in going for. So if you really want to be a developer, we're going to teach you some skills that will, you know, cover that. And um, it also depends. Like if you really are interested in building websites, then, you know, we're, we'll push towards JavaScript and HTML and whatnot. If you're really interested in uh, doing backend server stuff, then that's, you know, that's, that's different. Um, so yeah, it, it, would, it would depend on what your goals are and what you want out of the program as well. The nice thing about it is we do have kind of where there's a core of niche skills that we know that people can really, if they have them, they'll get hired off of those. And then uh, beyond that, yeah, it's a specialization. We do have quite a lot of um, freedom when it comes to specialization that way. And uh, the most important thing I want to emphasize here is that See, we are not here. Uh, of course, we will be teaching. We will be teaching everything. But as Nicholas mentioned, it is more of an active learning. So basically, we teach you something and then we give you assignment, like a project. And the project that you have to complete, next day you show. We be, and we are very demanding. Nicholas is more demanding than me. He will <laughs> ask, show me what you did yesterday. So because we are nobody here to waste the time. Neither we have, we want to waste your time, neither of course, you don't want to waste our time. So if you are come, if we are showing up every day, we expect you to also show up every day, if possible, and do some work because Rome was not built in a day. You have to do every day consistently, and then you will see the result. If you think that you will be doing like a two hour on a weekend, it doesn't work. I'm giving you a very simple example. If yeah. anybody has done any, any time in their life, any kind of sport, anything, bodybuilding, weight loss. Do you think you can go to gym once in a week and you will get all six packs abs or you become like Arnold Schwarzenegger? No, Arnold used to work eight hours every day since he was like eight year old. So you have to understand the muscles are not built in a day. Similarly, these skills, you have to train your brain over and over again. What I will say, even everybody has a different lifestyle, different busy, a lot of my students, they're actually working. So I at least recommend at least put maybe half an hour, one hour every day. That is one thing. Yes, everything we have a pre-recorded session. Maybe uh, I can. I mean, we have the uh, the link that is there. I think Nicholas shared. It is uh, basically it's all a pre-recorded session. So we have a self-paced uh, platform, which actually, uh, which is basically like a Coursera kind of thing. So over there we have all the recording videos are over there plus whatever we do recording we also uh, what i'm saying we also basically record the session so that you can watch it on a later later time so key things here is that so you will have all kind of uh, i will say resources needed uh, for you right now i pasted a link you can just click on that i mean maybe i'll share my screen and uh, quickly showcase you guys what we have 
uh, how to share this with you. And just a couple of things I'll say about that as well is that um, if you go to the, the course registration page, you're going to see a lot of topics. We're going to help you um, kind of figure out which things to focus on too. So don't don't worry about going there and be like, oh, I have to learn all of this. It's going to take me a year. Um, we can really help you kind of like, these are videos that give us the flexibility to teach people different things, depending on what they're, what jobs are going to go for. But the core skills are a, definitely a subset of what's available. And uh, just quickly, the other thing um, before Shannon kind of shares this stuff is that um, when we talk about what the kind of requirements are for the program, um, the way it always works is that each day I'm, I'm going to say, hey, would you please do this for tomorrow? And then the next day, I'm going to say, hey, could you show me what you did yesterday? Now, whether you succeeded or failed doesn't does not matter to me. What I want you to just come and show that you did something yesterday and that you're, you're working on. So we know you're making progress and we can kind of keep steering you in the right direction, right? So if you go home and you can only do 30 minutes that day, but you come in and you say, hey, I can only do 30 minutes, but this is what I got done. And this is what I'm looking at. I'm going to say, hey, that's great. Like, like good work. And if you can do eight hours and you really bang something out, we're going to be like, whoa, that's, that's really great. But it's always going to be the same process. I'm going to say, oh, look what you did. That's so great today. Could you please do this? for tomorrow and we just keep the ball rolling right it's, it's a really nice environment but it's also an environment that keeps you very consistent about what you're doing if you're the kind of person who start and stop um this we, we will make sure that you change that habit which is super important of course yeah and i think if you just put enough effort i mean whoever did the program wholeheartedly fully nobody has been uh, like uh, like unsuccessful of course if you do for one month and you think of a magic or you're not putting an effort and showing up sometimes or not doing, it's not going to work. And so, for example, this one. So this is basically showcase the whole thing. So this is how this is. So you, we have pretty much everything uh, recorded in a way that uh, like in a self-paced uh, Coursera style you do there. Of course, when you finish the whole thing, you get a certificate and pretty much every sub module has a test. You do that. Why we are asking you to do that? Because of course, uh, like for example, how a TCP IP network works. Will it matter if I explain you face to face or a my video or a Nicholas video explaining? It doesn't really matter. You can go there. What we are adding value is that once you learn the networking concept and we will help you to write the program, say maybe a, write a packet sniffer or something like that. I'm giving one example. And when you face the problem with the packet sniffer, that time we come and help you to finish the work. What happens is that you learn the theory and in the practical time, this is where you need a mentor, someone to help you. That is what we will do. And that is what call active learning that how you learn rather than that you are reading the whole networking book for one year and you never wrote a program. And that is what I, I had. I did my electronics engineering. Fourth year was one full chapter, a full, full subject was about DC and data communication network. We read about everything, TCP, IP. And to be very honest, I six months I read, I just couldn't understand how does it work. I just had no idea. And when after two years later, I got an opportunity to write a sample like a TCP IP program, like I told you, right? The debit credit application, those it has a lot, a lot of transaction. That time it made me clear, oh, this is what I'm talking about TCPO. Oh, when I send a packet, sin, act, sin, act, this is how it's happening. Then you see in the computer, you run a wire shark and you see boom, packets are going. Imagine I just, I was just thinking during when I was studying, if someone would have in the, my education system, they would have said, Hey, you have read the theory, let's write a program and then do a wire sharp. Believe me, my whole chapter would have finished maybe in uh, I will say maybe a week or so rather than six months. I couldn't understand. So that is where we are adding value. So basically theory lecture is to actually clear your mind. Okay. This is a base stack you have. And then basically you write it, you do it, you doing by learning and you will see the difference. And once you write the program, see, for example, a lot of people say, I need to brush up skill of TCP IP. You might think, okay, maybe I'm teaching. I know, but to be very honest, I haven't read TCP IP brush up since first time I wrote the program. Because when I wrote the program, I troubleshooted, I went through a numerous problem of typical why the packet is not going there. I need to check the sin. I did it so many times, 15 years ago, it is still fresh in my mind. I don't have to go back and read. I, I will never ask anybody, oh, can someone say, hey, can you explain me the first project did you did? You can go to my resume and ask, I can right away tell what I did exactly step-by-step, step, how many modules are there, because why? because it had my blood and sweat. We spent nights and nights. I, I'm not sure now people do it, but I think in startup they do it. 
we used to not go home for seven days. And you'll say, how is it possible? I mean, this is what we are, we're all like, it was our first job and we delivered a project in three months, but work amount we put like a 24 seven, like wake up coding and just in the office washroom, go there, take shower, come back again. So I don't think I can do that anymore, but back then I was 21, I could do that. But anybody's young, I will say, you guys should push hard and, and deliver. And that is, that is how it expedited my learning. Like in a three months, I had experience of almost three years. And, uh, and this is why I never, I, those things I can never forget because how I did it and pretty much the whole group, what we did, we did it. So I think uh, this is how basically I learned my software development. And right now you have Google. Back then, Google was not that much. I'm talking about 2005. Google was not even very popular that time. Very limited search was available. Not Stack Overflow was not even there. So imagine all the troubleshooting I had to do on my own with the tools and man page or books or somewhere. It was not like that. So, so I think how hard you get it, it lasts longer. How easy you get it. It's like similarly, like if you build your bodybuilding, right? If you build your muscle with a sheer, sheer effort, the muscle will stay longer. If you took steroid, of course, it will pump the body in one month. But the day you stop the pill, boom, everything, you'll be like a balloon, you'll be gone like that. So just uh, think that it is a real thing. And of course, we are not boot camp. like two days you go and bye bye. We will be here with you for long. Of course, we expect commitment from your side. Also, it's not like that you come and you're not uh, putting in any effort. So basically, you're wasting everybody's time. So I would say be appreciative and, and be decisive and jump and you will be successful. And it's just a matter of fact that if you start now, you will be ready for the 2021 hiring. And if you're still on the bench thinking, oh, this side, that side, pretty much 2021, you'll be again joining this webinar and listening it. So it's all up to that. If you want to make a decision now or you want to wait for eternity. So I think it's all up to everybody, uh, I think. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, I have project. Uh, experience yeah yeah okay yeah. i think that will be work for you i think for tom i think your case looks like you are already worked in it world right and so you want to become a tech uh, so what do you want to become like you want to become like a like a tech uh, worker or you want to be a tech project management you want to become an it project management work yeah, IT project management work, I will say that even the basic tech will be good for you. It will give you understanding of the technology. I think I would recommend the, the entry level program, the journey to tech. It will give you the complete overview of what technology is. So you already know project management. You will understand a little bit of project. And I think for you, to, you don't have to spend so much time. Pretty much if you are able to watch those videos, come to our q and I think three months you can sell yourself as a IT project manager. And I would say, I would you, I would say after doing that, yeah, 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 everything is there. Yeah. And uh, then basically I will say, if you can get the scrum certification and all this thing, that may be one shot for you also. So I think I would recommend that approach for you. Yeah, this is kind of one of the things that we really like to do is that people coming from different backgrounds, we can tell you kind of what the fundamentals are and also maybe some certificates that are really gonna help like be very specific to your goals, right? And that's just because Shannon has so much experience that so we can do that. So um, I think a lot of to do with project managers and understanding the whole system that the project is involved with. So um, a lot of the fun the fundamentals are gonna help you understand like the system that IT projects are gonna be conducted in. So yeah, very important. Yeah, get us from an agile officer for sure. For sure. Okay, if there's not any more questions, I think we'll leave it there for tonight.